Hey everybody, welcome to the Least Cast. I'm your host, Matt. I'm Nate. And I'm Drew. Alright, hey everybody, welcome to the Linux cast. We got a good one planned for you dinner, or at least I think it's good. Nate thinks the topic is a dud. Okay, and I- I'm already thinking, but we'll see how it goes. We're going to predict the future tonight. We're going to talk about Linux in 30 years. Uh, and I'm sure we'll meander off and talk about Windows at some point. I want to talk, because we-, we really can't talk about Linux without talking about Windows. At least I don't think so. So, we got some stuff to talk about. But before we do, as usual, we're going to go around the horn and talk about what we've done this week in Linux. So, Drew, take us away, please. I put out two videos this week, Matt. Uh, Two NextCloud videos, to be exact. And in those videos, talked about how to improve the UI, as well as bookmarks and configurable share links, external storage tasks, and the NextCloud deck. And I found out that fewer people than I even imagined care about this topic. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> if you're talking about uh, viewership, then uh, it was a dud. But I, I I recognize that I am the niche of the niche of the niche with Debian, Xorg, and Nextcloud all, all combined, basically. So I may be the worst YouTube, you, YouTuber with regard to monetization in the history of the world. So, And I'm fine with that because it's fun for me. So... There you go. There's something about the so, so I'm, I pu- published my Cirques one last night and that too yeah. flopped. It, it's th- those I had a good time. I thought it was a good topic and the next your next cloud videos were fantastic. So I don't you're all fucking missing out. Go watch his videos. You know what? It's, it's the how tos, Matt. It's the how tos. <laughs> So a lot of times, though, Drew, sometimes those will, they won't do well, like right when you publish them. But over time, you know, yeah. as people, you know, look them up, you, you know, they'll find yeah, find them and l- the views will go up. But sometimes not. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm convinced, though, that Cirque's one that I just published was killed by YouTube because I said, stick it to Google in yeah. on the thumbnail. So I'm pretty sure that it just got killed by the algorithm. I mean, like, like, very, very likely. I'm surprised I didn't get demonetized in the comments turned off for terrorist comments or some shit like the last time I did an anti-Google video. All right, Nate, what about you? What you done this week? So I'm actually getting ready to release my second video. And I've actually been doing some recording to catch up because basically I want like a few weeks ahead. So that's kind of what I've been working on. And I have installed... I don't even know how to pronounce it. It's B O D H I, whatever Bodhi. Linux that you want to. Yeah. So I've installed that on the W530. I think I want to stick with it from there because it has an older, I think it's 5.15 kernel. And my CUDA cores just work. So I want to keep it on there, let it do its thing, and see how it tests. I will say the desktop environment is ugly as crap. That's but the one that it uses works. like, um, um, it has one called like mocha or something like that. Yeah, it's, yeah, yep. it's, mm, that's it. It's like it's like a very old. What, what's it based on? Man, his names. Um, it's based on like mocha is what it's called. Yeah, it's it's like a the one that uh, Budgie was gonna move to that you to use the library for. I don't remember what the names are because um, I'm shit with names. Um, yeah, I, I agree. The, oh, it some, yeah, it was Enlightenment. Enlightenment, that's Enlightenment, the name. Yeah. Thank God I have two friends here better with names than I am. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really bad with names. But yeah, that, that that's they um they have some themes for that, Nate, that aren't much better than what the default is. Have you played yeah, with Yeah, no, this, I've already the, checked it out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's some some like, horrible. They were like it really horrible. bad. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much all I've been doing. And uh, of course, I, I've been doing something else, but that's going to be my nugget of the week. So I'm going to wait all right. on that. Now, I guess that means it's my turn. What the hell have I done this week? Uh, <laughs> I put out a video on Cirques. I did great. <laughs> I, I did actually make that video. Oh, I know what I've been doing. I have been messing around with my Bash RC files. So I really like a very small Bash RC file. I source everything that doesn't need to be there. So I, all my aliases are in their own file. All of the environment variables and stuff I either pull out and put in dot .profile or I have in a sourced file. And then I also have the, the functions and stuff in their own file. So I have a, there's a very concise um, bash RC in it. But it had been getting a little bit cluttered because I, tr- I tried out Zoxide. I started to use FZF a little bit. I tried out that thing that that the add to in or whatever that you were talking about, Drew. So a lot of that stuff had to be built into the shell, and so 
some of the stuff I wasn't using anymore. So I got, like, I got rid of Zoxide because it was causing some issues with some of my aliases. So I cleared off a lot of that stuff. I also, on some of my home lab VMs, uh, I had put both Zoxide and Oh My Posh on there to make the, the, the prompts a little bit different so I knew which machine that I was in. But Oh My Posh updates like once a week. And when there's an update, it prompts you for the update. And that kills your ability to SSH into the machine using the host name. And so I always had to remember what the IP address was. And I hated having to do that. So I killed Oh My Posh and all the servers. And I'll have to go and build my own um, prompts so that they look different. Instead of using something that was ma just making me lazy. So that's basically what I've been doing. Also, I did an update on all of my home lab VMs this week. And I will say this. Josh, if you're out there listening, you were right. And you know how much that hurts me to say. And just for everybody else out there, if you decide to do a home lab and you want a lot of storage, but you don't want to connect it internally, don't do what Matt did and use USB. It's just not a good idea. It's just not. I mean, it's, it. I'm going to suffer through it, but it, especially if you're going to use like Proxmox, because Proxmox pass through of USB is very fucking flaky. So half the time when I do a reboot into that, my storage server, my storage VM, half the drives just won't, don't connect. They're, they're there, but they don't, for whatever reason, it doesn't follow the FS tab and follow and actually mount them. So I've written a script to, when that happens, just to check to see if it mounted, and if it didn't mount, mount it. And I don't know that I trust the script all that much, because I don't want to mount things in the wrong place or whatever, and, and plus I wrote it, so... Uh, I'm not convinced that it's a good script at all. So uh, that's basically what I've been doing this week as well. So there you go. Now let's go ahead and move on to the main topic. So I will be 100% honest with you. I stole this comment or this topic from Linux After Dark. So credit goes to those guys. But I want to talk about this because last week we talked about the past, right? We talked about where we came from, what the distros we used. So... What I thought we'd do this week, and I have some notes here, but also we'll do our regular winging it of it, talk about where we think Linux itself will be in 30 years. And assuming we're all still here and Florida is not, you know, ruined by a hurricane and Oklahoma hasn't been hit by all the twisters in the movies and Michigan isn't a glacier, um, we will maybe talk about where we think we'll be in 30 years when it comes to Linux. It'll be very esoteric because I'm sure... I'm going to be on OpenSUSE, Nate's going to be using uh, <laughs> Pop! OS, and Drew will still be using the 6.1 kernel in 30 years, I'm sure, because it's Debian. So, there you go. <laughs> and I've ruined the Let's go with that. Because <laughs> that would mean I'm actually alive. And I think that's a good thing. So, cool. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're not that old, Drew. It's all right. All right. So, first, let's go ahead and first, let's talk about, just in general, what you think the Linux landscape will be in 30-ish years. So, Drew, why don't you kick us off? So, I don't know that there's going to be... I mean, we need to start making inroads into a lot of other areas, but as far as, like, ser servers, if we're talking about enterprise, we already dominate in that area, you know, in terms of, you know, servers and, and, and you know, enterprise systems and so on and so forth. I think that's you know, that's awesome that we are so dominant in that area. And I hope that we even continue to grow. To me, it's going to be a question of technology. And can Linux as an open source project compete with all these closed source projects that are going to be, you know, coming into play in the next 30 years? Where will AI be? in that timeline where will the desktop be because we've been waiting for the the year of the linux desktop for ever and so as far as that is concerned you know we, we've got a lot to talk about there's a lot to talk about in terms of where where linux actually fits in the market in a number of different areas where will it be in mobile where will it be in ai where will it be on the desktop those are some of the things that I'm kind of curious if we can kind of get into uh, with regard to, you know, the, the future. The future has so many different aspects to it and technology changes constantly. So I don't know, you know, when it comes right down to it, there's, <laughs> there's so much that can happen in that time. 
Yeah. So one thing we were, you said there was that technology changes a lot, and, and that's true. But it never changes in the way we think it's going to change. So if you, I don't know if you guys ever seen some of those magazines and newspapers from like a hundred years ago that were predicting the future. I was saying like, oh, we had would have flying cars, people would be living to two hundred years old, and all this stuff, right? They they all predicted that technology would advance really really fast, but none of them really were able to predict exactly how it did. And if you read science fiction novels, they sometimes do a little better job of predicting where the future is going to go. Sometimes depending on the author. So 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 like you read a lot of some of the older science fiction from like the the eighties and maybe even a little bit earlier than that. They did a I mean some of the technology there actually did come in. Like if you watch if you for example. Star Trek, there you, you can see some influence that it had on the technology that we have today. Obviously, not all of it, but what I'm, what I'm meaning to say is that when you when you talk about technology, predicting where technology is going to go, you're almost certainly we're going to be wrong about it. So it, be, it will be interesting to see because you're right that we do have to talk more about categories of where Linux is going to fit in and, and how other technology is going to impact it because. AI is going to be an interesting one because it feels like it's here to stay, which is which kind of also makes me sad. So, Nate, just in general, what do you think in terms of where uh, Linux will be? And then we'll start getting to some of the specifics. So I honestly believe that Linux will probably bump up to around the 10% mark in desktop just because of, you know, what Valve is trying to do. Secondly, I do believe that ARM is coming hundred percent and so arm laptops running linux will eventually come which means that we might have you know the eight hour battery life that we've been looking for for how many years now because yeah linux just goes full throttle on every laptop but um i to me i'm interested in seeing not just what linux could do in general but also what is coming as far as like application wise, because it's one thing to have the hardware, but if there's more applications that's a actually able to be, you know, become normal for Linux, then at that point, technically there's no reason to ever, ever rely on windows. And I'm not sure if I actually see windows even being a thing in 30 years, just from the way that they're doing things. That's a real big question. Don't you think? I mean, what yeah. are they going to screw up something so badly that the market completely reverses, you know, will that happen? Well, I mean, and look how much, look how much they're actually. So instead of focusing it, instead of focusing on their OS, look how much stuff that they're actually pushing into Linux now versus actually windows. And they keep trying to open up windows sort of like Linux, but yet, you know, hold on to the money. So I guess we'll see where, how that goes. And I'm pretty sure we'll probably have an answer within five or ten years. Yeah, sooner rather than later, I would yeah. think. Well, it's going to be... So the problem that Microsoft has when it comes to Linux is that it's really hard to monetize as a piece of software. But they've managed over the course of the last ten years to transition over to something like Red Hat has, already, has been doing for years, whereas a lot of their stuff... They don't make the prim their primary money on selling the bits. They make their money on subscriptions and services and stuff like that. So they already have the infrastructure in there for being able to monetize whatever direction they go in. The problem they face with Windows specifically is how are you going to get someone, just random Joe Schmo who goes into Best Buy, to pay for win uh, a $10 a month subscription to Windows when they've never had to pay for it before. You know, it's it's a cost from in the on the consumer's part that they've never experienced before, and they have no reason to want it, right? When you talk about subscriptions, right, the like if you want to pay something, you always seek that out, right? You know, Netflix has Netflix has something you want to watch, so you pay them money. Uh, you you want a, a streaming service for music, so you go you go pay Spotify or whatever. It's something that you go seek out or it's an absolute necessity like a phone bill or you know whatever right so it's something that you know you have know you have to have and you get something very specific in return for it with for for microsoft to be able to transition over to what they want to do when it comes to windows it, it means 
having people pay for something that they've always not only gotten for free, but most people, the vast majority of people, have no interest in Windows whatsoever because they don't actually use it. They just open it. It's just a transition into Chrome, right? So that's fair. Their their yeah, their future in terms of how it impacts their transition over to Linux or whatever they end up doing very much depends on them being able to solve that problem because Linux itself is also free. So if they can't like say that like tomorrow Microsoft decided that they were going to ditch Windows, the NT kernel is going away. They're going to come out with their own brand new Linux Linux distro. But it's not free. You have to pay five dollars a month for it, or ten dollars a month for it. Nobody's going to use that because if they're going to switch to Linux, someone else is going to. Well, use in thirty them. years, Matt. I mean, I think that you know you have to. Because uh, to your point, Red Hat and IBM, the growing influence of corporations in the Linux ecosystem is uh, concerning to me, honestly, because. You know, we're, we're it's the the future direction of Linux is right now in the hands of the open source community, and will that open source community still be in control in thirty years? I would hope so. I, I mean, I, I I would hope so. But you have to admit there is a growing influence of corporations in the Linux ecosystem. And Microsoft would just add on to that, and so they they could follow the lead of what's already been done and, and how it will continue. The, the question, like to answer your question, like will the community still play a role? Not just a role, but actually be in control. Re, be in control. Yeah. Well, the question is, are they in control now? I mean, I mean, you can you can make a claim that Arch and Debian are in control of all of the distributed uh, distributions beyond that point. You know, they, the, you know, beyond Debian and Arch, both community-based projects. Yeah, I mean, everybody else is kind of like, okay, Ubuntu okay. is taking on that role as a, you know, corporate influence distribution. Let, let me, oh yeah, let me ask, let me push back on that just a little bit. How would Debian be if you took out xorg system d pipewire pulse audio wayland how would how would their distro actually exist without any of those technologies because yeah. every single one of those di technologies which every distro relies on it was created by red hat basically right there it's very much in control of red at hat. what point though like, like, it, like before it, or after corporate control like, like if, if let, let's like let's just say Debian decided that they were going to go full on Libre, right? Like, like say in ten years from now, co corporate control has gotten so bad, and um, Red Hat continues to want to monetize literally everything, um, and Debian says, "Let you know that's enough." How do you think Debian itself would transition over to a world where they had to go full Libre? In that you know they can't use anything that is c touched by a corporation. It would suck to be honest, because then you'd go back to the also days. Well, I mean, because so the kernel would be fairly easy because Libre kernels exist. The pro the thing is, like, it, it would require a lot of work for the other projects. So, like, with I mean, Xorg, they could just get rid of that completely and just fork Wayland. I mean, Things, you could fork every project that you just mentioned too. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and some of them have already been done. So, like, if the, if System D for whatever reason got too bloated or whatever, too corporate influence, th there are alternative init systems that are there and ready to go. In fact, they've considered moving to different uh, init systems in the past. Uh, they've had votes on it and stuff. So, it, it, it's the re the reason why I ask all that is just that it feels like. When you talk about, I mean, we, we, we did a whole episode on corporate influence. It, it just, they have their greedy little fingers everywhere. And also, on the flip side of the more positive way of looking at it, without their uh, money to do those projects, those projects probably wouldn't exist. Or someone else would have to do it, or it'd be way more fragmented. So, so Debbie would have their own display server, their own, you know, uh, init system, whatever. And then other distros would be on their own. Yeah. So the, the, I mean, in the future, I mean, adding Microsoft to that mix of things, 
I'm not sure sure you know how that would play out. Also, Microsoft isn't because they're not an open source company whereas like Red Hat is. Like Red Hat yes, their first primary source, you know, primary goal is to make money because you know they're owned by IBM or whatever, but because they've always fo- always focused on OB- IBM their developers contribute massively to a whole bunch of open source projects. Whereas that's not traditionally been the case with Microsoft. Most of those guys have been working on proprietary software forever, and they're just now f- getting into having developers who are primarily open source developers, right? So it, it, it's, it, I, I knew when I chose this topic that we'd almost immediately devolve into talking about Windows because... The future of Windows really does, I think, play a big role in where the where Linux goes, right? Well, I would actually add to it as well because I think we're leaving out Google. And the fact of the matter is, Chrome OS is technically based off of Linux. I mean, it's based off of Gentoo. So the fact of the matter is, where does Google fit in this picture as well? Because if they decide, because they're slowly going to a more open source kernel to an actual Linux kernel. And so with that being the case, what does Google bring to the table? Because, you know, we could talk about Mac OS, but the fact of the matter is you have to buy the hardware that costs an arm and a leg and a kidney, you know, that it just, it is what it is. And so not everybody's going to be able to buy that. So you're going to have all these machines that's got to run something. So the question is, if Microsoft goes the route of a paid subscription and they can either buy Mac OS or they can use Linux and not pay for a subscription to use their operating system, where does the people go from there? That's the question. You know, even even more than that, Nate, I mean, uh, we, we, we look kind of like in a micro, in a, in a micro scale, but if you're talking about the global, you know, if we're talking globally, Linux's low cost and flexibility right now is an ideal solution providing uh, resources to developing countries, and they can't afford that stuff. So I think we, have, you know, and if that is the case, then hopefully, like governments and nonprofits can and in and countries that don't have like a already solid infrastructure can turn to Linux to deliver those kind of affordable uh, resources in education and healthcare and government resources and um, and even mobile devices. Who who knows? Okay, so why do why do I have to be the the grumpy old man in the in the room? Because that's your role. Because <laughs> mm-hmm. you, Susa. Uh, <laughs> okay, so first off, we, we have many examples in the past of governments choosing to use Linux and then almost immediately being bought out by Microsoft to use something different, right? That happens a lot. So whether or not that changes in the the future, I don't know. I I think that from a government perspective, switching over to Linux is 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 a chore simply because it does require a lot of effort and resources to do. It's not that Linux itself costs any money. It doesn't what costs money is the support that you have to put in in order to actually get it to work, the training that you have to do in order to get people to actually use it, along with transition. Because when you switch to Linux, you also have to figure out you have to switch away from Microsoft Office. You have to get rid of Outlook and go to something different. You have to, if you're if you're using, you know, if you're, you know, Adobe Shop, you have to figure out alternatives for that, you know, and if you're using like Excel or, you know, some random accounting software or whatever that doesn't work on Linux, you have to find alternatives for that stuff. And all that stuff always costs money. And that requirement of resources isn't something that is automatically attractive to people just because the software is open source. But from a non-government perspective, the problem is... And this is a problem that we've always had. And and I'll be interested to see if you guys think it'll change. Linux is free, but the hardware usually is more expensive. So because it's so much rarer, if you go to like System76 or Tuxedo or Slimbook or whatever, and you look at the prices, a lot of times they're quite a bit more expensive in terms of, you know, low cost PCs than other like buying a Windows PC and just putting Windows on it. So you can get a you can get a Windows PC for like four hundred dollars. I, I challenge you to go find a Linux PC from a Linux vendor 
for that price. You just can't do it. They're all very, very expensive. Uh, not Apple expensive, but in terms of like comparing it to a cheap Windows PC. So do you guys think in the future uh, for that that hardware problem will solve stuff more the vendors will offer Linux PCs? Because that's really the, the breaking point here is that they're just... Because there's so few that offer Linux as a primary operating system, they can basically charge whatever they want, right? Because they're they're, they know they're never going to be mainstream anyways, so they can basically, they're catering to us nerds, basically, and corporate corporations. Do you guys think that the hardware situation will change at all in the ne next three decades? I can jump in, yeah, but because I think that traditional Windows versus Linux desktop is going to be gone in 30 years. As we see it right now, traditional desktop might be, and we're going to shift to a more cloud computing where the OS doesn't matter as much. But that OS will be Linux-based. You know, that cloud-based OS will most likely be Linux-based. So I don't know that we're, and, and, and frankly, I, I haven't bought like a computer with Linux pre-installed ever I buy like soup something super cheap and then ditch Windows and put <laughs> put my Linux on there, and maybe that's just, maybe that's just you know maybe I'm the weirdo, but the fact of the matter is it's I mean I don't know that hardware is that expensive comparatively if you can just like get something and put whatever you want on it. But to to my point before I don't know that the Linux versus Windows desktop battle is going to be sustainable in thirty years. So you, you mentioned that you'll, it'll be a cloud. That's where you see Linux going is completely like cloud native or whatever. There will be no local bits. It'll just be streamed over the Internet. I think so. I mean, I mean, I, I would be curious to, to know what you guys think in, in terms of like, I mean, is there going to be desktop? You know, what what will ne be necessary in order for the desktop user to have computing power? Is so, it going to? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Well, uh, sorry, I, I kind of went three ways with this in my train of thought. Number one, I don't think, because the way that Microsoft is moving now, if you notice, they're slowly starting to put their applications on Linux, even in the enterprise stage. Most of the time, you used to have to buy Windows Server. Now, you can run a Linux server and use quite a few of their actual applications on Linux, and you don't have to worry about using a Windows server. That is coming. As a matter of fact, in, in my in my book that I just did for my certifications, they had a whole section covering Linux because they said, yeah, you're going to have to know this. So that within itself is a huge step ahead. Number two, I don't, I kind of agree with Drew. I don't think that the OS itself is going to be based off of cloud, but I do believe a lot of applications are moving straight to strictly cloud. So even though if you may have an OS that you can tweak or whatever, you're probably still going to have to log in and actually use a web browser or something to actually use your application. But here's a third section that I that keeps coming to me. We have a set of kids that are growing up now that don't even really use a computer. They use a phone and a tablet. So it kind of makes you wonder, okay, is it actually going to be completely cloud-based? Because a lot of these kids don't, I mean, the most they've used a the computer was maybe a Chromebook that they did schoolwork on, you know? And so, and all that's internet, most of it anyways. So the question would be, would it actually be cloud-based or would it just be the applications? Because, I mean, technically Chrome OS, still technically Linux, is an actual operating system, but it's a lot cloud-based. So I made a video a few weeks ago, maybe a couple months ago, where I talked about how I'm transitioning over a lot of my previously native applications to the web clients. So things like Discord and Jitsi and uh, the Mastodon client that I use and ProtonMail, all the stuff I now use in a, in, in a, a, a tab, in, in a web browser, whereas I used to always prefer a native client. And... I hate it. Like it's the most useful because the applications themselves work better than their native clients in a lot of ways. Like the Discord client when when I was using it was always breaking, and the 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 web tab that never breaks, right? So 
because it's not reliant on the operating system, it just it's just basically streaming it from a server somewhere, wherever you know, wherever. So I say I hate it because I do feel like I pref- still prefer. So when you described that future, Nate, of uh, everything existing in the browser, that I, I threw my head back in in horror because it just sounds horrible to me, and it doesn't sound like a future of computing that I would enjoy all that much. And, I mean, I think we can talk about this a little bit, because the, the, the primary goal, like you mentioned earlier, Nate, of, of Chrome OS was to be that portal to the web and all web applications. And it, it was also Steve Jobs' initial, like, plan for apps on the iPhone was all web applications, but it didn't work because it was too early. And Chrome OS was too early to do it because there's a lot of things that you just can't do in a browser yet. So they've had to bring in native support for Linux applications in order to expand their portfolio of what you can do with the operating system, right? But just because it was too early doesn't necessarily mean it's not going to be the future. And that worries me from a nerd standpoint, right? The three of us are nerds, the three of us like to tinker with our things. Uh, you know, we, we, we talk about how, um, you know, we self-host stuff and Drew just made a whole series on Nextcloud and all this stuff, right? In, in a future where everything is in the web, in, in, the, in the browser, it worries me that the future of nerddom is a little bleak, you know? And, and and it makes me sad if that if that's really the direction where we go. Where does innovation then go? You know what well, I mean. Well, I think also, you know, we talk about Linux runs all these web servers and the super supercomputers, and to to a lot a large degree the Android and smartphones. But in the next thirty years, it could be even more ubiquitous in ways that are less visible, and that would include like embedded. Uh, uh, kernel into the cars and appliances and medical devices and and things like that. The idea of the operating system may evol- evolve to be more modular, mo- modular and invisible. But as far as the as Linux is concerned, the foundational layer running across these ha- this hardware, virtually overall hardware, could be something that we we're not we're not doing currently so that could be another like thing that linux will be like taking over is like hard you know actual actual hardware you know like cars and appliances and so on and so forth so there's actually a drum module that's already has linux on it the a what module? As, i'm a drummer oh drums. and um i the the elise strata prime their module is a multi-core module and it's it's running Linux on the back end. And so if a drum company can do that, that gives me hope for future for actual audio and Linux being amazing. <laughs> Cause that actual module is really good. And there's something else, I believe it's oh, SpaceX uses Linux to run all their stuff. Uh even on the uh the uh what's it called? Discussion? I haven't. I can't even think of the it. The space station? Or? Starlink? No, the uh, Starlink. Thank you. Yeah. Even that. I'm is the ba- one that's bad with names, Linux. okay? You can't have my thing. <laughs> Listen, we both have dyslexia. That's a bad operation on, on, a, on a podcast. But, anyways, but yeah, like there's already numbers of things that's already starting to run Linux, and a lot of it already connects to the cloud. I kind of agree. I, it makes me sad, and I don't want that future, but. How do you stop it when it when most people would consider convenient? Yeah, when you're talking about like like I'm a software developer and all I have to do is go introduce one set of instructions or one alter the code in one place and it just populates everywhere else. Okay, so what we're describing is actually our kind of already here. So uh, if George Castor were here right now, he'd be shouting at us that his distro which is not a distro it is cloud native that's that's what things like bazite and bluefin and aurora are right they're so they're cloud native linux containers machines distros whatever you want to call it and the idea behind those from what i understand and i've been 
talked to about this many times from George is that the idea is that the operating system such as it is is something that you just never touch. Like that that thing is just there and you're meant to have all of your interactions with any application inside of a container. Things like Flatpak or DistroBox or what have you. Things like that. And while that's not quite moving all the way into using everything in a web browser, removing the influence of the operating system 100% is where I think that the like the quote unquote immutable distros or composable distros or cloud native distros or whatever you want to call them, uh, where those things are trying to go, where you will use a distro, like Fedora, Atomic, or whatever, and you'll never touch the operating system itself. You just install your applications and you go. It does all the updating for you. It's exactly the same on everyone's PC, so when something new comes down, it just installs it. And if something does break, which would be fairly rare, it's going to break for everyone and will be immediately fixed, right? So the idea of that idea where the operating system becomes so removed from user interaction isn't out of the question, right? Because it's already something that a lot of people are already thinking about. and But it is also something that's very removed from what Linux traditionally has been because Linux has traditionally been for tinkers. It's, it's very much a tinkers thing. And while it has moved into being able to be more mainstream with things like the Steam Deck and whatever, but even... Even the Steam Deck uses something that is immutable or whatever you want to call it. So even they have said that it's this, we're using Arch Linux, but it's basically just a base for the Steam Paint that we've covered over it. You should never really interact with the operating system itself, right? It, you know, so the idea that Linux itself is, you know, traditionally been for tinkers is something that I think will slowly change, but we nerds are very stubborn people, and when Linux changes or when something new is introduced that we don't like, a lot of times we hold on to the old with iron fists. So things like Xorg and, uh, you know, I don't think anybody's grabbing onto Pulse Audio and wanting to keep it, but, you know, whatever, you know, or... People who don't like systemd, they take it and and you know do something different, like run it or open RC or whatever. You know, so there there's going to be a pocket of Linux fools who aren't interested in that future that we're talking about, and that right there will prevent. It won't be it won't prevent, but it will keep Linux bifurcated into the future and the past for what I think is going to be a very long time. So things like you know, alternative init systems actually being able to have traditional Linux distros, those things will live on and will probably still be here in 30 years. The question will be how they manage to maintain themselves and how they, because eventually where the future goes with like the mainstream will divert so radically from what traditional Linux has always been that they'll kind of and have maybe, to do and their maybe own maybe that's going to be like attached with hardware, Matt, because, you know, when you're talking about, you know, traditional desktop PC and the fact that us, we Linux users are, let's just say 3% of, you know, three, we have a 3% market share for desktop right now. Let's just, I don't know if it's a little bit more than that. Maybe, let's just say three to 5% somewhere in there. Okay. Mainstream maybe buying the computer with a th like cloud driven thin client already built into it where linux becomes the dominant os for that cloud workstation or that virtual desktop you know instead of it being windows maybe that's what we're going to see and maybe that's what windows becomes is that thin client computing that ends up connecting to a you know, cloud workstation or a virtual desktop. Yeah. Do you think that, um, do you think that when that, like if that, if that's the direction things go, do you think that there will be a, like, how do you think that that transition will go? Because cause it's traditionally different than, uh, you know, what has always been. Do you think, do you think that there will be a lot of pushback or people will just, it, it will be, like a frog in, in water or whatever, slowly people just transition over to it and they maybe even not, won't even notice. 
we're not normal. I, I think we have to all recognize that we're, sure. we're, we are not the normal desktop user, not even, not even a little bit. Okay. People just want their shit to work. You know, they, they could care less about tinkering. They just want to like to Nate's point, they just want to open the browser and they want to go to Amazon and buy something, or they just want to read the news or they just want to know what the weather is going to be like. I, I, you know, I think that we are, we're not in the same boat as everybody else. We are not typical. What I meant was the, um, like, like, okay. So what do you think will come first? That thin client idea or moving over to the apps that will support. And when I say apps, I mean like web native cloud native apps first. Do you think we'll get those cloud native apps first? Yeah. The apps are already here. Yeah. I mean like the applications are already slowly moving towards straight web regardless if we want it or not. I mean, even Adobe, as much as they talk about Photoshop, they have every year they release a new part of their web application for Adobe Photoshop. And so it's already coming. The problem I have is I am a tinkerer, but I also know for a fact that technically the way that we use Linux will still be around. Because think about this. Think about how many retro gamers there are. There are still systems running around that has Windows 95 and Windows 98. They still have, some of them have Windows 3. Uh, some even still run the Apple 2. Like all that stuff is still available that they're using. Yeah, and so it will be around because there will still be us. You know, I'm going to be, you know, defiant until the end because that's just my nature. But regardless, I still think that... To your point that she was talking about the immutable distro, one one problem I have with immutable distros, you talked about how they could just push an update. Well, that's the same crap that Windows does, and I hate it. And so for me, I won't use a immutable distro because I, I don't want none of that stuff. I want to be able to say, hey, okay, I update this, update this, and that's it. So for me not to be able to touch my operating system is a problem. But I can also see where... As Drew was talking about, like, you know, you can get an ARM laptop, have an immutable distro on it. You know, it has great battery life. It'll run for a while and you just mostly use cloud applications. And that's honestly where I see it going because more likely there will probably be a tablet that runs some kind of Linux distro. I don't know if there will ever be a phone that has a Linux distro ever, but we can all hope. Ubuntu um, Touch came but, out two days ago with a new uh, with a new OS. <laughs> yeah, I seen that, but yeah, I still I still I know, say it. it's just, not ready. I know. So, I'm just kidding. Yeah. But I mean that that's honestly where I see it. Unfortunately, I hate to say it because I am a tinkerer myself. I like to deal with my own applications and build it out and all that kind of stuff. But the fact of the matter is. I still see it going to cloud because even like, even if you have one of these, okay, you use this thing all the time. How many applications that you use still sync back to the cloud? That's, that's fair. Okay. So just to go back to the, uh, I hate calling them immutables because that's not a word that they use anymore. The, the atomic distros, the cloud native distros. Mm-hmm. The, the th- thing is that I've been, so I've been using Bluefin for months now. Uh, I use it on my editing piece rig. I had it on my laptop until we tried Nabarro there for a little while. And the thing is, is, like, I thought, I was like, you, Nate, I was like, I don't want my PC to control the updates. I want to do that thing. I really actually enjoy sitting down in my, at my computer and running sudo zipper duck. Say what you will about zipper, it's slow as fuck. I know that, but I still enjoy having the control of going through and doing that every four days. I like to be able to sit here and watch it. I want to make sure that there's no errors. I want to make sure that there was no, you know, nothing deleted accidentally that I didn't want deleted because of, you know, auto remove on Debian or whatever. Like, it, like, like if you think that, like, if Debian had a, a, a atomic distro, having auto remove in the background would just scare the crap out of people because you know auto remove doesn't always remove the things you wanted to remove, right? So, but having said that, I've been using it for months and it's been kind of refreshing to not have to ever like I, it's. Updated every it doesn't prompt me f- to reboot my computer. Just it just waits until the next time you want to do a reboot. You, when you reboot it, it does the what needs to be done in the background, and you're done. It's it does all the application updates without you having to re- realize it. It doesn't ki- like you guys remember you used to. I don't know if Firefox still does this, but when you update Firefox and you're you still using Firefox, Firefox will then tell you that you've done an update and you have to restart it in order to continue to use it. 
It doesn't do that on, I don't know about Firefox, but at least like Vivaldi doesn't do that, right? So Vivaldi got updated in the background. I didn't know it until the next time I came back to after doing a restart and it says your browser has been updated. And that's cool. I'm like, yeah, I do like the control. I do like doing my own updates, but there is something to be said about not having to touch any of that stuff ever, right? It, it, you just use your computer and do your work, play your games, do whatever you need to do on it, and you never have to worry about having, like, when was the last time I did an update? The problem becomes is when things become too automated, the things that can't be automated easily fall by the wayside. So things like backups. Bluefin's not doing my backups for me, and I, I've found myself very lackadaisical on that system about doing backups because I've... It feels like everything's automated, but the backups really aren't. It's something that I'll talk about in my review. There's a there's a false sense of security when it comes to those type of things because everything is done for you, and the things that aren't done for you just kind of float out of the back of your mind. So it's just I I don't know that I agree with that direction, but having used it for months now, it does feel like that it. it if you wanted to put it on your, your your mother's or your grandmother's computer and you you didn't want to do any maintenance on that thing, that's the type of distro that's that's absolutely what you want to give them. Because you're never you're like if you just re installed regular Ubuntu uh, on someone who's tech illiterate, you have to be the one in charge of doing an update. So if you live like hundred miles away, every time you go there you have to do the updates because you know they're never going to do it. With a with a cloud native or immutable or composable distro or whatever that stuff's just done, and every time they reboot the computer, which is probably all the time, it just does the updates in the background. They never know it happens, and it's up to date with security wise, and their applications get updated. They never touch it. It's the best way of doing a new user distro, I think, and it, it's sad to say because it also does take away that uh, innovation and, and that tinkerer spirit that kind of has driven Linux to where it is right now. You know, so. Well, and that's where I feel like the Windows influence comes in, because that's technically what Windows does. It updates. The only difference would be is that when you update with your distro, it doesn't immediately tell you you have to restart in thirty minutes, or we're going to kick you out of the game regardless. That's the main difference. <laughs> it does it way better. So, like, it does it. It does it way better than Windows does it, because you like, if you use Windows for long enough, you know this. When it does Windows update, things slow down. Like, the, the whole operating system will slow down. So you know it's doing an update. And also, immediately when it's done, it does it. It prompts you to reboot, right? Because it has to reboot. Everything on Windows has to be off in order for it to run. It's just the way that the registry works, right? So it's going to force you to do it. I, on the Bluefin or whatever, it doesn't do that, right? It, it's completely in the background. You don't know that it's happening until you turn it back on and you are all of a sudden on the next kernel. Like, it just happened. Like, you didn't even know it was going to happen. It, you, you, if you don't reboot your computer for 10 months or whatever, it's not going to tell you to do it. It's just going to wait until you finally reboot that computer, and then you'll get all the new stuff. And, well, like I said, I, I don't know that from a tinkerer's point of view, that's a good thing. From a mainstream Linux point of view, I do think that that's the way that it, it, it should be. Uh, not necessarily because users can't be trusted to update, but more because it allows for greater stability in terms of everyone's using the same, uh, you know, the, the same thing. Everything, Everything's exactly the same, and it just it just works really, really well. That's why I think the thin client type thing is, go is going to happen because of that type, of, that exact situation that you're looking for. It just, the update is, it will not be handled by the actual user. It will be just handled. And you gotta, I gotta, I think you have to, we have to recognize too, that it's like, you know, we have our, you know, and this again is, we're not talking about today. We're talking about 30 years from now. You know, we have applications that we love, these kind of monolithic applications. But I mean, to, to you know, what do you, I mean, you really love your Docker containers, you know, your virtual like software basically. And that is going to be the wave of the future, basically, you know, you're talking about Docker, you know, you know, or uh, containerization is what I'm looking for. Containerization 
It's not going to be on your machine. These are not applications that reside on your machine. They are somewhere else, and you're using them. Yeah. And Arch Penguin in the chat says that you, you can do plenty of tinkering with OS tree-based distros. That That's true. You can still do a lot of tinkering with the current atomic distros. They're basically Linux with automated updates, from what I can tell. And, and that's just fine. So it's not it's not as dramatic. But we're talking about in the future where more, you know, it, it's much more... I'm not going to say locked down. It's just... Nobody cares about the abilities. You'll probably always be able to tinker with something because uh, it's going to be open source. So even if it's the thin client that Drew's talking about, you're still going to be able to go in and do stuff with it because it's open source or whatever. It's just the things that you can do it will be changed because it's not going to be as broad or you know as monolithic as the current kernel is, right? So before the we kernel jump in- will the kernel will sorry Matt uh, the kernel will evolve as well because we're talking about. You know, we didn't really get into AI too much, and that's I was fine. Gonna go, I was going to go next if that's what you wanted to do. Okay, go ahead. Um, just going into AI, where, where do you guys think then that AI plays a role? Because Microsoft is obviously all in on AI, right? That like that's the thing that they're doing. They've they've invested like fifty billion dollars in open AI, which is the, behind ChatGPT. They they've uh, they. They're doing this stupid thing where they only have one word for AI, but they have multiple different things. So everything's co-pilot, but they're not all the same co-pilot. But they built it into everything. So much so that now I have a brand new Linux or brand new Windows laptop. Didn't keep Windows on it. I put Linux on it. But it has a co-pilot key on the keyboard. Like it, really? It, yeah, it has a brand new key. And it, it's just there. I don't I have no idea what it will. <laughs> like I have no idea what it does. But Presumptuous. <laughs> Yeah, it's just there. So AI is the thing that Windows is for sure doing, right? It's built in, absolutely happening. In fact, already happening. And, you know, Apple's doing it. Google's doing it. Where do you guys think that AI is going to get its hooks into to, into Linux? Because it probably will happen. Who wants to go first? Drew? Well, uh, you know, over the next three decades... I think Linux will end up becoming the primary operating system for AI. And if it's not already, you know, if it's not already, basically. And, and you're talking about specialized distributions and they'll be tailored for lar- large scale machines and quantum computing. And the kernel, our kernel, <laughs> will be optimized for that massive workload. And, you know, new drivers are going to be like, developed for you know for that particular you know ai and quantum computing and it's 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 coming I mean, it, it will it will arrive in in the next 30 years so is it good no it sucks i don't want i mean we've talked about this agnosium about privacy you know but at the same time i don't know how again we were talking about avoiding certain things by being a tinkerer and having your own uh, privacy-based uh, operating system, but you know AI is. What are you gonna do? I, I don't know what. Eh. So if you look at the AI that exists currently in op- open source form, a lot of like the the language models and stuff are like things that you don't. Like. So there's this thing called Whisper. It's like a, a voice transcription thing, right? And none of that's online. You download those the language models to your computer and then it does all the work with your hardware comparing against that data set right and i don't know i don't know how they get the data itself i'm i'm that's probably the privacy disrespecting part of it like they, they, they get that data from somewhere but from a computational standpoint i think that local computation for this ai stuff is going to be where linux differentiates itself but I want to be a curmudgeon for a little while and just hope and pray that AI just dies. And I think that there's a good chance that in a few years, AI will not be here. Or at least that's not what they'll call it. Mainly because it feels like a lot of the hype around it has transitioned it from it being, wow, that's really cool, to that's eh, kind of a gimmick. And... I, I think in a lot of ways that is the I don't remember perception is ninety percent of the way people react to things, and from a from a mass humanity perspective, AI has not 
proven to be the game changer, I think, at least so far, that it was hoped to be. But there's such a gigantic commercial push for it to succeed that something is going to be AI. Whether it's actually AI, I don't know. And from a Linux perspective, I think this takes us back to our corporate talk earlier. Corpor- the corporation influence in Linux is where AI is going to finally come into to Linux. Because, because the corporations want AI to happen, and it, I think that somewhere along the line, they'll work that into their plans for, for Linux. The question I have isn't how that affects like um, the computational or the server or the enterprise. How does it affect me as a desktop Linux user? Like, am, am I going to have a like if I, if I launch into the next version of GNOME, is there like going to be like a GNOME AI you know button in the dock or something like that that I have to deal with? I mean, is that the direction we're going to go, or is it going to be much more subtle in that it just kind of pops up in individual applications? So like if you download GIMP 3.50 or whatever in in 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> um, do, are you going to see AI worked into that? I'm just kidding. Gnome 3 is not going to be out in 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Matt, that's just rude. Uh, <laughs> but you guys get the point. Like, like, how do you guys think that AI will work itself into the desktop itself? Like, we'd, It'd probably come to that enterprise and stuff like that, but do you think that... I, I know we're going to move into thin clients and stuff like that, but Still, people are going to have something to use. Do you think it's just going to be all browser-based, so everything will be on the browser? Or will we have integrations with other things? Like, How do you think that that's going to play out? Well, so I personally think that Linux is going to still be Linux at the end of the day, which means that I do think AI is coming, and it's going to be integrated into the actual operating system. But I still think it will probably wind up being in the use case that you can just click it off if you wanted to. Just for the simple fact, uh, look at, well, look at uh, what Canonical did with the Amazon thing. Everybody made a big th- deal about it, but the fact of the matter is, you literally could just click a button and it turned it off. You know, even now, if you want to send a report to, you know, say, hey, if my system crashes, send a report to, I don't know, one or, Manjaro or whatever, or Pop OS or whatever, you can do that, or you can just click a button and say, no, I don't want to do that. I still think Linux will be that in the future. I don't see that going away. What I do see it happening is applications slowly implement it into their system. And so, like, for example, it's already there in VS Code. I was typing on VS Code a while ago, and it, it was automatically trying to tell me, oh, you can say it this way or this way. And I'm like, go away. I don't need you right now. But I do think that's what's going to happen is it's going to go into those applications. And I'm not so sh- sure if a thin client will actually be the full answer that it's going. But I do believe small mini ARM PCs would actually be probably the use case that it goes to. Just for the simple fact they can solder the RAM, they can solder the chipset, they can solder the storage and basically kind of lock you into something and sell you a piece and then say, oh, if you want to upgrade, you know, your stores, then, well, you can be like Apple and pay another 200 bucks just for 512 gig bots. <laughs> but anyways, but that's do it. That's do, that is where I see it going. And I do see like the AI itself just slowly been integrated into applications itself. But I still think Linux is going to be Linux. Yeah, I think I'm I was you. thinking more in. Go ahead, Nick. Drew. I, know, I, I was just say I, I was thinking more in terms of enterprise because I know I mean, as far as AI is concerned, uh, I mean, we all recognize that COBOL is still a viable way to program in uh, banking software, you know, which is crazy because there's, you know, because there's so many different, uh, there's so much better languages out there that are much more powerful than COBOL. But there's the guys that are my age still programming COBOL. But once that's, once AI sinks its hooks into enterprise for specific tasks, it's here to stay. I mean, COBOL is still here. So, and I'll give you a real world example. One of my best friends is heading up a initiative at a large company where he has has been tasked to to basically take their HR systems into the 
21st century and beyond. And you, I mean, once they do all the data analytics, AI is definitely going to be a part of the solution process, which will be implemented over the next five years, which will carry them into the next, you know, 25. So, you know, that, that was really my point in terms of AI and quantum computing. It's much more on going to be on the pre, more prevalent on the enterprise side. I don't know that it will be, uh, you know, like we know we, we're desktop users, but we are going to be affected by enterprise solutions. No question about it. Yeah, I agree. And I think that Nate is right in that it, from a user, des a desktop user perspective, applications is where we'll find that AI plays a role. So we'll have, you know, a lot of stuff will be in the browser. So every browser that we'll use will have some kind of AI integration. I mean, a lot of them already do. Uh, I, I know Firefox is working on something. I know Brave has Leo. Surprisingly, Vivaldi doesn't have anything with AI yet, which, which I'm very thankful for. Um, but I'm sure it will come. I, I, I'm sh Chrome has Gemini integration all over the damn place. You cannot get away from it. You, you use Microsoft Edge, you're going to see Copilot all over the place. So a lot of the AI user-facing features are going to happen in the browser, but also individual applications, like things like, I, I'm sure, like Inkscape and, and I, I made fun of of GIMP earlier, but I mean, eventually maybe some AI tools come to those if they, you know, get their act together. Um, so things like that, I think that from from a user perspective, it will be the applications that have the the the, the AI come to them. And it, it, let's say from 10, 15 years ago, distros are still a thing. I don't think that a lot of distros themselves will have AI tools. I think that they may have include applications that are AI tools, but I don't think like you're, you're going to open up Fedora and all of a sudden, you know, uh, Cortana Jr. is going to pop up and say, hey, would you like me to enable RPM Fusion for you? You know, <laughs> maybe they need that. I, I don't know. So it, it, it's interesting. So Drew, on your list of, of research, was there anything that we didn't hit that you wanted to? Uh, not that I want to. <laughs> Let's put it that way. I mean, we, we could talk about privacy if you really want to, uh, you know, with regard to um, how Linux will be still as private, I mean, as it has been in the past. But, um, you know, we also talked about how the corporate side of it could affect that. Okay. Let's go ahead and skip the privacy stuff for now, and we'll go ahead and move on to the nuggies of the week. All right. Can, can so, I make a one comment? Yeah, go ahead. So one comment, well, I'm going to make two. For one, AI will be there because NVIDIA has already released their massive rack with NVLink. That's running Linux, by the way, but it's one massive ties of GPUs together. And somebody mentioned that AI doesn't need benefits or time off. But the fact of the matter is, AI, regardless of what we do, there's going to have to be a human that fixes it. All it's going to do is create new jobs that we've never had before, just like computers has. They always said back in the 70s, oh, computers going to replace everything. And yet here we are today still having to hire more technicians because people's got to fix it. So there's always going to be jobs. There's always going to be Linux is kind of basically what I was going to say. I agree. Okay, let's go ahead then and move on to the nuggies of the week. So this is the last part of the podcast that we do every week. And we've called it something that uh, I vehemently disagree with because I hate the name. Uh, but... It is what it is. So these are our picks, our tricks, our apps, or whatever you want to call them. And basically things that we'd like to share with you guys that uh, we just have found over the course of using Linux or whatever. So, uh, Drew, your Nuggie of the Week, please. So I have done, like I said in the, at the top of the, uh, of the podcast, um, did two videos on NextCloud. So it makes sense that I actually talk about a NextCloud application. And it's a NextCloud Deck, and it's a project management tool that is part of uh, NextCloud suite of collaboration tools. It is a board layout where you incorporate cards, and it can be like a you know file integration, and it can be part of your calendar integration. And you can assign projects if you are in a if you are in a group setting and uh, you want to assign or organize tasks and track progress and collaborate with team members. And even if you're just by yourself and you want to track specific ideas, uh, NextCloud Deck is an excellent tool for managing that. Cool. Nate, 
your thing you, or your nugget of the week? So, once again, here we go. Uh, Pop OS 2404. In particular, what I want to talk about is actually the Cosmic Desktop because I have been testing it recently. And in particular, I have been testing it on this, I call it my crap way because it's literally a Celeron dual core Intel piece of junk. Is Gateway even but still in my, business? Yeah. Well, yeah. Because this, is, really? this used to run Windows. Yeah, this ran Windows 11, which I completely wiped. Okay. <laughs> so, but That's I shocking. actually started testing Cosmic on it because I just wanted to see how it works. To my surprise, Cosmic ran extremely well. And so, you know, just like F XFCE, if you want something that is Wayland that runs extremely well on a piece of junk of a hardware, I would honestly say give Cosmic a try because I was totally surprised. I've not had it fail once. It hasn't crashed. And even though it's still technically in pre-alpha, it's been super stable. So that is my nugget of the week just because I've been testing it. I am astonished that Gateway is still in business, to be honest with you. I'm sure it's owned by someone else now, but my very first personal computer was a Gateway. We bought, like they used to have those, those stores, right? You, you go into a store, and then like two or three weeks later, they'd deliver you your computer. It would come in about 40 boxes. And I, I remember this. I, I was had just entered high school, and we, we it, it cost probably $5,000 at that point. It, and it came in a, a huge number of boxes. It, it had enough literature on it to stuff a library. Like, like back in the day, you actually got books on how your computer worked. I don't you, you kids these days, you know, you don't know how to use your computer because they don't have books anymore, and you don't even know what a book is. But, it, but anyways, the, it, it's just it's astonishing that that company's still around. It just absolutely blows my mind. All right, so my nuggie of the week is an app called Flipboard, and this thing has also been around for a very long time. But it's a, it's a mobile application for news, and it's all curated by its users through social media. And one of the reasons why I like it so much is because they've basically completely gotten rid of X, and X is in Twitter, right? They've completely gotten off from Twitter. They're, they're using Federation and Mastodon and ActivityPub for all their stuff now, and I like that stance. Whether you like the, the agree with the politics of X or whatever, I, I, I don't care. But I really do like the federated nature uh, that social media, at least some social media, has taken on. And Flipboard has managed to make a news or transition their news application from what it was to using uh, ActivityPub and the, the, the Fediverse uh, in, in a way that really, really works well and was basically seamless like it's still really really good and it's available on basically any mobile platform that you want to get it on i wish it had a little a linux application but it doesn't so but there you go flipboard is mine so that is it for the linux cast if you want to get in contact with us you can do so the easiest way to do so is via email it's uh, that's uh, email at the linuxcast.org is the contact information there uh, you can find drew who makes Nextcloud videos now? You should go watch those things because they're really, <laughs> really good. Um, he's he, he's just a guy Linux on YouTube, youtubecom slash just a guy Linux. And and if you don't care for the Nextcloud stuff, first off, shame on you. Um, but you can also I'm still do it. I don't even care, man. <laughs> <laughs> you just go over there and watch some of his Debian and ButterFS stuff. It's pure crack. Like it's it's nerd. It's nerd porn is what it is. It's awesome. That went creepy really fast. <laughs> anyways youtube.com slash just the guy linux it has been a long fucking day so i have no clue what i'm saying just get off my back nate also has a youtube channel i have no clue what the name is i i i remembered it it's like it's nate picks tech world there you go you need to come up with a better name uh, just something that i can actually remember i i beg of you please <laughs> <laughs> just say Nate and then look in the description. Yeah, anyways, yeah. in the description, you'll find links to both of those guys' YouTube channel. You can also subscribe to this YouTube channel, youtube.com slash LinuxCast. If you want to find any of our other contact information, the best place to do that is on the website, which is the LinuxCast.org. You can find all of the contact information at Linux, the LinuxCast.org slash contact. There you'll find the, the 
the, the Discord servers and the email addresses and all of our links to Mastodon and all the places you can find all of us. So head on over there. Check it out. You can also support the podcast, patreon.com slash linuxcast. I release a weekly exclusive podcast over there for all my patrons, also on YouTube as a member exclusive as well. So there you go. If you want to watch us live, we do, in fact, record this live every Tuesday night at uh, 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. I'm never late, and anybody who says so, completely lying to you. Uh, 8 o'clock p.m. on the dot, sharp, just like a train. We never miss it. So there you go. You can ca- so you can catch us live. If you can't catch us live, you can find the podcast on every single podcatcher that you could possibly imagine. I- I've-, I've put in a-, a lot of work to making sure that the podcast is available anywhere you want it. So Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all those things. You can catch the edited version, which is basically just this, but without the ums and the pre-show. That is spectacularly edited by Mr. Nate there, so definitely check that out. That's released every Saturday evening, I think. Right? Saturdays? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, so there you go. (laughs) I don't even know what day it is anymore. Anyways, that's it for this one. Check us out next week where we'll be talking about who God knows what. Uh, I'm sure I'll come up with a good topic. I'm sure I will. Anyways. (laughs) I'm, I have to have a proctor, so, so someone who comes up with the, with the with the ideas for me, because I'm out of ideas. Anyways, there you go. We'll see you guys next week. Peace.